<laughs> okay. Welcome. Everyone got food. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, we're going to talk about dogs, but I can't help myself. Um, so I'm going to tell a cat joke. <laughs> Why did the cat run away from the tree? It was afraid of the bark. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Judy, you're, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, I hope you're enjoying your dinner too. <laughs> About four hours ago. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so let me get back in my screen. All right. So um, we're going to talk about canine cognitive dysfunction tonight. Um, here's our introduction slide. Um, I think everyone knows me, Greg Peach. I work more or less in one way or another with just about everybody at the room, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and up in the, the corner of the screen, she couldn't make it. Um, she decided to move to Massachusetts recently. Um, so just, just down the road from my parents' house where I grew up. Uh, yep. so I this is uh, Judy Kelher Anderson. Um, and she is um, um, founded and is CEO of a company called uh, Here Nascent. Here's a little bio about her. Um, Judy, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll go quick, quicker than this says. So um, I've been in uh, uh, biochemistry for a long time for at a number of different uh, biotech companies where I uh, discovered and developed small molecule therapeutics for neurological disorders. Um, and uh, then after many failures, uh, not all my fault, um, I founded Neuronascent. And um, at Neuronascent, um, we actually discovered and um, are developing therapeutics. They've already, uh, one of our therapies for age-related neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease has already completed phase 1A. So um, we're we're heading toward phase two, and um, maybe we can talk about that drug after. So go ahead, Greg. Thank you. All right, oh, and more thank yous. Um, Prem is buying everyone dinner tonight. Thank you, Kelly. So she's been uh, getting all this stuff organized for well, these <laughs> are organizer. Yeah. So. <laughs> So, but that's who's hosting us tonight. All right. So, so what is, what is CCD? Clinic cognitive dysfunction. How often do we see it? Uh, in our companion dogs and in, in Fairbanks, um, we think a lot about sled dogs. It's a resource we have. It's a large population. Um, and, you know, this is a progressive neurodegenerative disease of the aged dog. Um, I think probably everyone that's been in practice has seen this. Um, it's a pretty common thing that happens with old dogs as they age and, and progressively. Um, put on here, maybe found into in up to 30% of aged dogs. Um, I mean, pick a number and you can find a paper that says it's what it is. It really depends on the what age range they're looking at. Um, it's kind of across all the the board, um, you see some really high numbers. Um, like I was reading something the other day and you know, they're looking at like, I want to say like 16 to 17 year old dogs or 16 to 18 year old dogs. And it was like virtually all of them were scoring in that range, which is, which is probably not surprising to, to you guys. Um, but part of the problem is like testing it. Um, like, how do, you, how do you diagnose it? Do you just say, well, yeah, I, I think that's what it is. Um, so we want to talk about kind of what, what tests um, should we be using and can we use in a reasonable use? Um, right now, the gold standard diagnosis is brain histopathology, which is not typically something done while you're still alive. 
Um, so most of us aren't doing that as a diagnostic technique uh, in practice. Um, and I, I think maybe we don't spend a lot of time thinking about, is it what it is? Can we score it? Um, do we need to put a name on it? Because I mean, really the question is what, what are we gonna do about it? Um, there's not, there's really not great treatments out there. Certainly everything that exists is, is really supportive care, symptomatic care, um, you know, diet, um, Hills, uh, science diet, Hills makes the BD diet, um, various supplements, antioxidants, omega fatty acids, um, selegilines on the market, the only approved drug for treating CCD in dogs. Um, so, monoamine B inhibitor. Anyway, it increases um, neurotransmitter levels in the brain. Has anyone used that in any dogs? <laughs> Once upon a time. Once upon, yeah. Has anyone had any success? See, head shaking? No? Yeah. It's a little spendy. It's a lot. Didn't do, yeah. We used to have conversations over about do we stop this with special order for, for someone? Yeah. Um, so it's on the market. People can pull data saying it works. I've not seen it work particularly well. Um, people use melatonin for sleep wake disorders, medications to increase cerebral blood flow. Um, and, and environmental nutrition, um, exercise, um, these things maybe can help, but nothing's really stopping the disease. And it's a huge factor in euthanasia decisions um, for owners. Um, you get these people, they haven't slept in six weeks because the dog is up every night, it's pacing, it's having accidents, it's barking when it shouldn't be. It's really distressing for people. And I've got I've had clients go on medications themselves just to keep having no for I mean, just their anxiety, their inability to sleep over this. I mean, it's really uh, it's really sad um, for everybody involved. Um, and and part of why we're talking about this is is the human condition. Um, and that leads me to my next slide. Um, it's um, it's basically Alzheimer's. Uh, it's an extremely similar disease to Alzheimer's. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's an age dependent disease. It's older dogs. Alzheimer's is older people. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll roll back for a second. I mean, I think all of us probably have someone in our lives or know someone that's affected by Alzheimer's or some other neurodegenerative disease. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's super common, huge impact, um, on everybody. Um, if there's anyone, some, some, some people know and love, maybe not love, I don't know, Dr. Stuvey, um, he's passed away now. He didn't have Alzheimer's, but he did have dementia. Early you know, onset. Early onset. Yeah. He retired and did not get to enjoy his retirement. And there was... There was nothing that could be done for him. It was it was horrible. And I'll point out, probably the last time I wore a tie in Fairbanks was my interview with Dr. Stuvey. <laughs> he made fun of me for wearing yeah. tie in this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but so it's it, it's really similar to Alzheimer's disease, and we'll we'll talk about it a little bit. But it it is maybe the closest. Uh, natural model to Alzheimer's disease um, that we know of in the animal world. Um, so, so things that we see that overlap, the brain loses volume over time um, in humans and in dogs. Uh, we see memory and attention deficit issues. So we can't, people can't remember stuff. Dogs can't remember stuff. They they don't know their training. They don't recognize people or places. We see sleep dysfunction. Um, these dogs are sleeping during the day and pacing the house um, at night. Um, sometimes filled with anxiety. 
um, social interactions will change. My grandmother had Alzheimer's and got trouble in the nursing home for stabbing someone with a fork because she wanted the last pork chop. Well, that might have just been her. Sorry, <laughs> but, uh, but you know the you know Fluffy is different than he was two years ago. Um, Grandma is different than she was two years ago or ten years ago. Um, see, competitive impulsive behaviors, anxiety. Uh, certainly, in humans anti-anxiety meds are a huge part of the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, and just daily functional uh, loss, daily living. Um, dogs start having accidents. They start to lose control of bodily functions, awareness, um, remembering that I'm supposed to go outside to the body. Sometimes aggressive. Um, and then, and honestly, man, this is something I didn't know until I kind of got involved with this. Um, and this is in, in people too, they lose a sense of smell is really interesting. Um, and if you've ever gone and done uh, like the scent training classes uh, over at Positive or have worked with dogs or seen a dog brain, uh, smell is, that's how they view the world is smell. It's super important to them. So I think that's a really interesting thing, especially in, in dogs, um, because the amount, the amount of brain power that can smell is just huge compared to so I was just thinking, you know, as you were talking about the importance of hearing in humans. So there's this connection between hearing loss and, and cognitive decline. And in the dogs, it could be smell and cognitive yeah. decline. For sure. So the two senses, you know, they're different, right. but it's the way that he's being, you know, that we right. get our information, right? Yeah, and, that, and that's certainly possible. That's something we wonder about. Um, in both dogs and, and people, um, when, when you do that histopath of the uh, brain, you you see protein deposits. They get beta amyloid plaques. They get neurofibrillatory tangles. Um, just things really go heck in a hand basket mm -hmm. inside the brain. Oh, and in in CCD, they they like uh, you frequently read this acronym. Disha, so disoriented, disorientation, altered social interactions, altered sleep weight, house soiling, altered activity, anxiety. So that's kind of in a nutshell um, what we're looking at these guys. So, um, you know, what are, what are we doing to diagnose them? And, and I mean, it's kind of, I think, in clinical practice is mostly like, yeah, it, it seems like that. Um, and, and right now, it really is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, you know, the old dog may be moving funny or not sleeping at night because he got really bad arthritis and he hurts or you know, something else going on. Uh, but you can't find anything else. Um, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, doesn't sink. Maybe it's CCD. But so things that we can use, there's um, a variety of behavior scales. We're going to talk about the trades questionnaire, and I, I've uh, given you guys all a copy of that. Oh, and I also on the table are sign in sheets if everyone can sign up. So I would say you guys were here to do that at the start, start. But we'll do behaviors um, scales to help identify CCD dogs. Um, we can potentially look at anosmia testing to see how well they smell and maybe track that over time and look for loss of smell. Um, we do MRIs and, and we do volumetric MRIs so we can actually measure things and we can look at those structural changes in the brain. And in, in all aging, your brain shrinks, um, but it's more print to the very genetic diseases. Um, and this is really a pretty new thing that blood biomarkers. Um, in the human side, they're, they're looking at blood biomarkers as part of the diagnostics for Alzheimer's disease in people. Um, they exist in dogs and, and hopefully someday become a, a, a tool for us. We'll talk a little more about those. So here's, here's our K 
page questionnaire. Uh, two behavior scales up here. So on the left is the mini mental state examination, MNSC. Uh, this is one of the tools they use in people to identify cognitive impairment. Uh, so this is um, what year, what season, what date, what day of the week, what month. Yes, these series of questions and you score them. Um, and so in people, you want to you want to score high. <laughs> so on this scale, um, greater than 24 was you no know, cognitive impairment. 18 to 21 was MCI, mild cognitive impairment. So MCI gets used as a term a lot in, in humans. We're not willing to say it's Alzheimer's, it's just MCI. It's, it's a transition state maybe. Um, and then um, when you fall, don't fall below 17, it's severe cognitive impairment. Um, that's when everyone's convinced that Things aren't working well for you. Um, so that's been around for a while. Um, not terribly long ago, this, this CADE scale, which is Canine Dementia Scale. CADE was the acronym they came up with. Um, they published this in, in 2015. Um, and it, it's a nice scale. And it's something that um, is really based on owner observation. It's broken down into uh, four domains. So we can have spatial orientation, social interactions, sleep wake cycle, and in house soiling. And so the the intent um, with this is um, for the veterinarian to see their client, see the patient with the older dog, how are things going? You know, give me concerns. Hey, your dog's eight years old, it's 10 years old. What are you changing? And and we can score the dog. And so, you know, we we work work through this and say, you know, ask the questions. Uh, um, are they disoriented in a family environment, either inside or outside? And um, and if nope, everything's normal, they get a zero. If yeah, I see them get lost in the yard multiple times a week, that would score a five. Um, so we have zero to five scale of kind of severity. Um, so once in the last six months, at least once a month, two to four times a month, or several times a week. So we kind of work through these questions and we score each section um, and come up with our total score. And this has been um, pretty well validated. Um, and it's this is a good scale at picking up kind of degrees of dysfunction. So we say, yeah, we're normal. Uh, it's really good at picking up the mild cognitive impairment. Um, and this scales the opposite. This is more like golf. We want a low score. So if you want to, if you want to score a zero. Uh, uh, but as we go up, it's zero to seven is normal. Age 23 is mild cognitive impairment. That's that MCI, maybe that transition state, but something going on. Um, we get up to moderate cognitive impairment um, and eventually severe. And those guys, um, the severe dogs, it's it's really um, quite noticeable. So this is a tool. Um, we've given everybody a copy of this, and I'm going to send it to people. Love to see people start trying to use it and practice. Uh, you get the older dog and it could be something that you include in your medical record, um, you know, as part of a senior workup. Uh, you know, you get BCS in your record and you could have a CAD score. And that's something you can, can track over time and, you know, try to identify these guys, talk about strategies to manage them. This is a um, um, slide about anosmia, anosmia. Um, so loss of smell. Um, so this is a this is a wolf. I um, actually tested wolves in the in this study and looked at different breeds of dogs. Turns out, like pugs, not very good at this. <laughs> <laughs> and wolves were the best. Um, but this is this is an interesting. Test and what they do, they've got these kind of ceramic pots and they're covering up 
is um, what are here? They cover up these Tupperware containers. And so what you do is you put some stinky treat in these containers. And so level one, that's an open container. And you, you hide it under one of these plots and you see if they can figure it out. If they get one, they keep going up. So go to two and that has five holes. Level three has three holes. Level four has one hole. And level five has zero holes. So it, as we go up those levels, it's going to be harder for that order to get out of the container. Um, and you try to randomize which one of these pots it's under so you can see, can they find it? How quickly can they find it? And so you can you can score them and say, yep, yeah, like this wolf can, can find all the level five, um, but maybe come back six months later and, you know, now we can only find the level three or maybe a level two. What's going on with that dog? And we think um, these dogs with CCD, we should be seeing um, their ability to do this drop off. So MRI, we love talking about MRI. We love our MRI. Um, is everyone in the room visited the MRI at some point or another? <clears throat> yeah, so we have an MRI at the university. Uh, and so they do this all the time in, in, in people with neurodegenerative diseases is let's look at your brain. They don't think anything of storing someone in a MR. And we see changes in the brain. We see shrinking as time goes by. So just normal aging, you get overall brain volume loss, uh, your ventricles widen, um, and, and you have neuron loss. There's, there is a difference though between our normal aging and you know, someone with Alzheimer's disease or CCD, um, we have to go from normal aging through MCI to Alzheimer's disease. We see significantly more loss in those neurogenic diseases. And specifically in, in Alzheimer's disease and in CCD, we see big changes in the hippocampus. Um, really important uh, structure in those diseases. A lot, of, a lot of pathologic changes happen there when we're looking at the histopath. Um, and physically, in the MRI, you can actually get in there and, and measure it. So that's one of the things that we can we can track. And we talked a little bit about like things you can do, supportive things you can do. And exercise, this is this is humans, um, well documented in, in humans. Um, aerobic exercise helps with Alzheimer's disease. And they've actually shown that and it's specifically aerobic, uh, but <laughs> Getting, getting the seniors out and dancing or spinning, or I don't know if they did this study, but, but doing stuff and working out the sweat makes a big difference. And they actually saw these hippocampi grow uh, in these patients. And in this study, they compared it to like light exercise. So just stretching and stretching to be helped. Um, my dad has, I don't know what he has, some sort of, Cognitive impairment, I don't know if it's a diagnosis, and I've talked him into going to the gym. And you know, I'm like, that's great. You walk the dog around the yard, but you need to do more. Like, so, so this is something that can do. And you know, I certainly wonder with our canine patients, um, are we the sled dogs that are really active and running, even if they're not maybe on the the race team anymore? Are they going to be doing better with these things than the cat dog who just sits on the couch? Uh, and right now, I don't think I have a slide about this, but there's not really any documented um, breed or, or sex um, productions for CCD in, in dogs. It's fairly equal opportunity um, to the rest of our knowledge. So there's our there's our 
MRI picture of, I don't know whose brain that is. Well, I think that picture, Carl. I think it's really good. Probably a sled dog. It's probably a sled dog. I know that, I know that brain. Carl, I, I, I expected you to know exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. MRI, Carl. Oh, I meant to do introductions. We'll do introductions at the end. Yeah. We'll have right. question and answer. But MRI, Carl, as I like to call him. Um, <laughs> scans scans lots of lots of dogs for the clinical practices. Um, I know Dr. Preston has been in there scanning with him. Dr. Hansen's down there. Well, I know has been there. Um, lots of people have done it. Sent patients. I know what. You've got someone coming from Anchorage in April to see why they're having seizures, right? Yeah. yeah. So all kinds of all kinds of things. So here was here was probably not that. Who oh, was that? Who knows? There's a there's a slice of the of a of a we're gonna say sled dog brain. Um, so here's another sled dog brain and. Uh, this is one of uh, Scott Freya's sled dogs. They do uh, are looking at a lot of uh, aging, brain aging stuff. So I was playing around with, with their uh, MRIs. And this is how we can do some of these measurements. So we trace out, and what I've got here is, is the, the whole brain kind of traced out in the yellowish. And then in the, in the center, that's the hippocampus. That's the left, that's the right hippocampus. And different views, um, this kind of thermal view, and then this you know, sagittal view there. But we can do that and create a um, 3D model of uh, whatever we're looking at. We can put the layers. So, this is a 3D model of this dog's brain, and that's the hippocampus sitting in the center. We can actually kind of spin that around and and, and look at it. Um, but when we do that, we can actually then start to develop measurements. Um, so what did I measure the stars brain at? Just over a cubic, or uh, hippocampus is just over a cubic centimeter. And one of the things you, that people will do with, with canines, canines are a little bit more challenging to do this with than people. Um, people's brains are all Pretty similar. Mine's maybe been accused of being different. <laughs> I think Hayden Neville just the other day accused me of that. Um, Can we take an MRI? Can we show? <laughs> but, but I mean, like a person's head is a person's head. Draw a strong magnetic field around it, make an image, send it to the computer, and the, the computer picks all this stuff out for you. There's some some pretty cool. AI stuff that can do a lot of automated measurements. Um, and there's just uh, so much heterogeneity, heterogeneity in dogs in, in general. I mean, you're, was it uh, the ASAP spay neuter the other weekend? And there was some little, like 20 pound dog there. And then there was some 70 pound dog in the other side of the room. And like they were cousins. So, you know, just these crazy differences in size of, of the overall volume of the brain, um, but their shape. Um, so a sled dog's brain is going to look a lot different than a bulldog's brain. Um, and so just even the angles of the structures. So it's it's hard to, right now. There's no good AI to, to pick these things out. You have to do it manually, but it, it can work pretty well. And it has been documented um, changes. Um, over time uh, to be tracked. So obviously doing an MRI is um, harder for us to do with our patients than you to do with your grandma. Uh, sometimes grandmas that have the Alzheimer's um, because women live longer. Um, and um, Human females are more prone to it. I don't know why. Judy might know why, but um, but you can do an MRI, you can do a PET scan on a person. 
just need their insurance to pay and just throw them in, hope they're not claustrophobic. You know, we've got to put them under anesthesia. It's a lot of money. You know, kind of to what end are we, are we going to do it sometimes? So I'm really excited about the possibility of blood biomarkers, both in, in dogs and in, in people. Um, and probably the last five years-ish, this has become a big thing in, in people. And they're doing, um, I think it's, it's a part of standard workup many times in elders. And so one of the markers that we're interested in, uh, and Judy is going to talk a little bit about it, I think, um, later on, is phosphotau. And tau is a protein in the brain, and it its job is to help form uh, the cytoskeleton of nerve cells. So the top of our slide, we get this nice, happy axon, and it's being held open by these nice lined up tau holding it open, just doing their job. With these, with Alzheimer's disease, with um, CCD, tau gets phosphorylated, and so when that happens, those molecules get disrupted. They don't function properly, so we start getting disruption of these tubules, kind of clog up the brain. Um, eventually, they lead to um, neurofibrillary tangles. Um, it's a huge thing in humans, one of the big pathologies that they see, um, not seen as frequently in canines. And that may be just because our patients don't live that long. Like our patient's entire lifespan may be the time period, you know, maybe it's 10 years. Well, maybe that's the time that you have had Alzheimer's disease that's preclinical to MCI, to having an actual um, significant cognitive impairment and being declared Alzheimer's. So you've had lots of time to develop an NFT. Um, the other thought is we just may be using the wrong stains and having some trouble finding them that we need different antibody on the histochemical staining. So there's a lot of research being done around cow and dogs. But when the brain gets unhappy, the phospho tau leaks into the bloodstream. So we can get plasma samples and actually measure this. And so the reason we want to try to understand more, try to think about how can we diagnose this? How can we start keeping track of it? Um, we obviously want to do the best with the tools we currently have, but we want better tools. Um, and so, you know, the first step is, you know, can we, can we make a reasonable presumptive diagnosis of it? How are we going to, what criteria are we going to use for that? Um, and once we've set up, like, this is what we're going to call it, you know, we're going to use our Kate scale. Um, we're going to do anosmia testing, um, in a research setting, we're going to get an MRI. Um, that gives us a chance to then start testing therapeutics. Um, and what we'd like is to test a safe experimental therapeutic that can help with these deficits in, in animals and, and humans. Um, so having, having said all that and having Judy introduce herself as developing pharmaceuticals for um, neurodegenerative diseases, give it her chat for a bit. Great. Thanks, Greg. Um, so we're, we're doing something maybe a little different. Um, we're talking about potentially taking drugs for CCD before um, making them available for humans, um, perhaps for the first time. And um, so if there is a need um, in interior of Alaska, and we have good ways to um, diagnose CCD, then perhaps we can um, begin to test uh, drugs that clearly 
are aimed at those deficits you're, you're going to be measuring. So we have, um, I uh, discovered a therapeutic, a small molecule, which means it can enter the brain, um, that actually promotes new neurons. And I think the problem with CCD, the problem with Alzheimer's disease in the past is that, um, as, as uh, Greg said, we've had only symptomatic relief. And if we're really looking for a disease-modifying therapy, one way to do that is to actually replace the neurons that are lost and ensure those then survive. Well, this sounds like a big task, but in fact, as we age, we still continue to produce new neurons in the brain, especially the hippocampus and the olfactory bulb. We continue to produce those new neurons. Now it slows with aging as we get, as this um, cartoon shows here, but um, especially in humans, we do continue to produce new neurons in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. So this is a good thing because we can take advantage of that um, production of, of new uh, of new neurons. Uh, can you change the slide, Greg? Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah, so what we what we originally did was we uh, used what's called a phenotypic screen, uh, which means we um, take um, libraries of small molecules. These are all novel, and um, we test those using human neural progenitor cells. So these are like stem cells uh, from the brain. And um, we look for ability to produce new neurons from those stem cells. And then we also look, are they also neuroprotective? So we, we put all of these drugs, or they're not drugs yet, they're just uh, chemicals uh, through this screening process and throughout the whole process, you know, many, many iterations, we actually came up with a therapy we're gonna call here cajuvenate or canine rejuvenation um, that actually produces, can promote new neurons in the brain and ensure they survive. And that's really important in these chronic neurodegenerative disorders. Next slide, Greg. So um, this is just showing you as we increase cajuvenate or for humans, it's called NNI 362 after neuronascent um, Inc. 362. Um, what we showed in very aged mice was that as we increase um, the dose in these animals, and this was given orally, um, we see greater numbers of neurons that proliferate and actually survived in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. And you see the hippocampus uh, slice below where vehicle, you see very few neurons that were formed and survived. But with NNI362, over a six week period, um, we see many new neurons in the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus, and what this, what this importantly leads to, and I hit the slide again, Greg, is that, and keep going, um, is that when we, and you, I think one more, when we see these new neurons, what we saw was that we could actually reverse aging deficit back to young levels. So with NNI362, uh, the far right bar is back to, this was a uh, cognitive measure, uh, is back to the young young levels on memory. So this is really important. So this, this was the, that correlation between new neurons being formed in the hippocampus and actual reversal of a deficit. So that means we can start with animals, with humans that already have the disorder. We don't have to give it before it happens. And that's really critical. Next slide, Greg, please. 
Um, and um, in a totally different model, this wasn't an aging model, this was a model of degeneration, we actually reversed anosmia as well. So um, um, back to, again, normal levels. Uh, so these animals, um, because of the treatment, um, it's um, AAV alpha synuclein model, these animals lost their sense of smell. But if we gave NNI362 for a, about a six week period as well, we could actually reverse that smell loss, which is really exciting. So this is why we think um, this compound could be so interesting for the CCD in dogs. Next slide. Um, anosmia is really an interesting um, concept and, and I'm sure everybody's heard, um, you know, with um, COVID, et cetera, a lot of people lose their sense of smell. And it's, it's a very common event in so many central nervous system disorders, whether it's Parkinson's, Alzheimer's disease, CCD, we know they lose their sense of smell. Well, it turns out that throughout our life, um, all animals produce new neurons um, that have to travel all the way from the subventricular zone all the way to the olfactory bulb. But when there is neuronal loss in the brain, instead of going to the olfactory bulb, those new neurons try to compensate for neuronal loss and they'll go to those areas of the brain where those regions that already have neuron loss. So what's happening is fewer and fewer new neurons are going to the olfactory bulb. So over time, you're actually losing the sense of smell. And it's not that you're losing neurons in the olfactory bulb, but there's fewer neurons going to replace those that are just uh, normal turnover. Um, and you'll see that in almost every CNS disorder. And that's why we think olf the olfactory bulb and the loss of smell is so critical to so many disorders. But we think because we're promoting new neuron growth, um, that we can, that's why we can reverse um, the, the smell loss. Next slide, Greg, please. So we actually have tested cajuvinate or NNI362 in um, aged, um, healthy aged population, humans um, in a phase 1A. Um, we had to have an IND. Um, these, um, these quote aged people were 50 to 72 which was a little disconcerting for us that are in that age category. <laughs> um, but the, um, so we're testing aged individuals. Um, really, we started just for safety and pharmacokinetics. Next slide, Greg. And what we showed um, and next is that um, with um, NNI362, again, this is orally uh, administered uh, we actually saw more potential treatment-related uh, adverse events uh, in the placebo group than we did with NNI362. So extremely safe profile. This is still an experimental drug, um, but it looks like a very safe profile. Next slide, Greg. Or, but um, what we also did, since we took plasma, uh, for pharmacokinetics, we also sent the plasma out and we looked at um, that plasma biomarker that Greg was talking about, phosphatau 181. And indeed, we showed um, a very significant drop of the phosphatau level in plasma from baseline. Uh, the placebo uh, uh, subjects had no change um, in that baseline over a two week period. So this is really this is really nice. We're getting a lot of different effects. This one, even though it's a phase 1A, um, we were able to show indeed the, the drug gets into brain and appears to have a beneficial effect without significant safety issues. Next slide. 
So um, here, just a quick summary of cajuvinate. Um, we know in, in um, using stem cells uh, or neuroprogenitor cells, we can promote new neurons, uh, hu human neurons. Uh, it's orally available. We know it crosses into brain, um, it has a really nice safety profile, uh, reverses behavioral deficits. So it appears to be truly a disease modifying rather than just a symptomatic effect. Uh, we know the mechanism of action, but I'll, I'll, I won't go into that because it's fairly complex and I don't wanna put you all to sleep and, um, we completed the phase 1A, um, but as you know, for humans, we're going to have to do a lot more phase two as well as a phase three. So it's a long process, but we're actually planning for cajuvinate in um, CCD animals. So this is one way we can uh, trial the um, therapy um, and actually get it even potentially marketed well before we do uh, for humans. Next slide. Um, so um, again, potentially uh, curative. Um, really what we're doing in uh, humans is very similar to what we want to do with the um, aged pets and working dogs um, in Alaska. Um, uh, the treat the aged uh, dogs uh, with uh, owner's consent, obviously. With the NADA uh, approval, uh, there's no need for actually further FDA approvals, where, as I mentioned, it would be quite a long process still to go uh, for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Next slide. I think, um, I think this is yours, Greg. Yeah. Myself. So um, we're really excited about Cajuvinate and what that possibly could do. And our long-term goals would be to conduct an interventional trial here and, and see if we can help older dogs. Um, we're not there yet um, to do that. But we want to launch a, a pilot study just to see how easy it is to do some of these things here. Um, how many dogs, how easy is it to, to find a dog with CCD? Um, are vets going to be interested in helping us? Is the community going to be interested in participating? Um, for sure, we have dogs around. Um, and so what we're doing now and, and why we've all come together tonight um, is to hopefully get people to help us find some dogs that we can just begin to look at. We're not ready to do an intervention yet, but we wanna start evaluating a few dogs and, um, and and see how this all works in our hand. And is it gonna be, is it gonna be useful tools for future studies? So what we're looking for are dogs um, eight to 11 years old, mid-sized dogs, 22 to 65 pounds. Um, certainly in the future, there could be other sizes, but I think this, this category is set um, on potential drug dosing for future studies. Um, <clears throat> we wanna find dogs with mild to moderate impairment. Um, you know, not totally out to lunch, not normal, but just so we can see what are we seeing in these dogs? What changes are we seeing? And we want otherwise fairly healthy dogs. Um, we want dogs that are gonna survive some period of time so we can track them over time. We don't want a lot of comorbidities and compounding factors um, that could be affecting their behavior, um, their physical activity and, and so forth. And so what we are looking to do is to um, get dogs screened with the CAGE questionnaire and looking for those mild to moderate um, cognitive impairment dogs. Um, and if we can find those, have you do a physical exam 
hey, dog looks pretty good. Uh, or, oh God, the dog can hardly walk. We don't want the guy who can hardly walk or who's in congestive heart failure or you know bad renal disease or, or something like that. But they want a fairly healthy dog that has cognitive impairment. We want to run some labs, make sure there's no big screaming problems um, there. Um, when we're getting blood for labs, we're hoping we can get blood um, for those phosphor tau um, analysis to start looking at that biomarker. That's yet to be validated in dogs. There's several biomarkers out there. It's not a lot of data yet in dogs. People are beginning to look at it. It's fairly new in humans. Um, and so we're hoping to start to collect data that we can correlate what we see with MRI, Cade scale, um, actually in, uh, in nosmia testing, and see if we start building data to see if the biomarker, the fossil tau, is a useful uh, test for us. And boy, that would sure be a lot easier if I could just draw blood and send it to lab and have a number to hang on if that's a actually valid thing to do it. Um, and we want to we want to scan these things. So we want our mild to moderate uh, cognitive impairment, mid-sized dog, fairly healthy, fairly normal blood work. We want to look at his brain or brain um, and do those measurements. And then we want to give them three months and do it all again. Are we seeing any progression on that case scale? Have they, have they gone from mild to moderate? Um, you know, make sure you no know, major physical changes have happened. Um, you know, make sure no other changes. Um, but get that P tau sample again and MRI the brain again. And then we can compare and see how much how much loss are we seeing? Are we able to get good measurements on the equipment we have? Um, at hand. If not, maybe we can get you that seven Tesla MR. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that, that's our idea, so, to see what we can start identifying. Right now, we've got a, a budget to scan two dogs. Um, and so we're hoping you guys uh, can start to identify some of these dogs and find people that might be interested in participating um, and, and talk to us about it. And so the idea is, um, if you know you're gonna be seeing someone or you're talking to someone like, hey, this might be a good candidate, um, get in touch um, just to make sure we have budget. Because <laughs> we're gonna pay for physical exam, lab work uh, for that, that patient. Um, if you've got someone that um, that you think is a good candidate, we'll, we'll cover that. Uh, if that all looks good, yep, they're healthy, nothing crazy in blood work, we'll pay for the MRI. Um, we're gonna have the MRIs read by a radiologist looking for any other abnormalities um, there. And then we'll ask them three months to just repeat that process. And again, we, we, we pay for, for that also. Um, but um, the asterisks talk to us. If, if we spend all our money um, and we don't know if someone's coming, we may not have money left. Um, but so that's the that's the gist of the, the study. We talked some, um, we go back to that and had nausea testing. That's something we are interested in doing, um, but we weren't sure if we we're gonna do at, at this point, although I think we might be game if there are owners or veterinarians interested. Um, I think once you're set up and trained to do this, it's probably not a huge big deal, but you, you gotta make sure we're randomizing stuff, we're not contaminating the, the inside of the bowls with our spam or whatever stinky treat we put in there and, and so forth. Uh, has to get video recorded so we can then review it and score it and stuff like that. So when we get to the point of doing an interventional study, this is definitely something we we want to do. Um, I think 
one question we had for for you as a, a group is um, how do you think you can identify smell or loss of smell in clinic? Like what would work in clinic? Um, you know, setting up the hall at Aurora to, you know, do this is probably not going to be great yeah, no. for the function of the clinic. <laughs> uh, but, you know, what's your questions could we ask or if you ask clients that you think might be useful information for us? I value versus low value traits. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Same, and I put these little things looking all around for it. And you're like, okay, that's good. I mean, that's not really right. Yeah. Well, and I think that's where and that we're not quite at that level, but that could be something to ask along, like who's doing the paid Kitchener, you know, have you noticed any loss of smell? Um, and you know, potentially if we get our two research subjects, you know, identified, we can work with the owners to, you know, set up doing this or something to see how, how functional it is. Have you reached out to like the folks that are doing all the scent games? Yeah. That's a good idea. We talked to Susan. Oh, we, that's a because we have idea. someone whose performance is here, and then all of a sudden their pet is performance is declining. So, so Judy, that was that was Doctor Cole. Oh, I was bad. I didn't do introductions, <laughs> but she she was mentioning uh, Susan Sampson, who is a, a vet tech, used to work at Aurora that that uh, Doctor Cole now owns, um, and she runs positive dog training, um, and they do all kinds of things, including um, like scent game trials and, and training. Um, and she used to be on search and rescue. And oh, so, wow. there are probably thirty to forty people that participate in the scent classes weekly. Yeah. Right now. So that that could be um, that could be a real interesting resource, even if we just want to play around, whether within this little project or not. For um, yeah, that's a that's a great idea. Or like have our own app, like for older than like older. It's probably most of them are younger. Yeah. yeah. And they're having to find way more discrete cells and odors than you're saying. Them, this is going to but... be. <laughs> they're going to ace this. They're going to be like the wall, not the pug. Yeah. That's a great idea. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I think I think Susan would be real receptive. Oh. Let's do that. I think they also talked about, Greg, I, th I think, oops, so one of the, um, one of the scales they had, it wasn't the Cades, um, but they used a, um, a system where they took the dog out into the hallway, paid a treat or a piece of meat or whatever it is, um, and then let the dog back in just to see how long it took. Um, but again, if the dog doesn't like the treat or the, the, the you know, there's lots of other smells and, um, you know, there's been dogs in there before, I, I think that that may not be the best, um, the best way to do it, but I don't know. So, but I think, I mean, if, if, if in clinics, you know, if you're talking to these, these owners, these patients, and you're seeing, you know, looking for recruitment and you're you're using the scale. And and I think the scale is really cool. So regardless of whether you ever send us a patient or not, like I think it's a great tool to be using um as part of our senior workups. Um and you know, I mean we report things like PCS, pain scores, all our other vital signs, and it could be a valuable um, way to track these um, these patients. So, yeah, and that's my next slide. Oh, Question. I have a back to those language. So I see your, is that total T4 and urinalysis? Is that what you're uh, Oh. Yeah. So what do you like? Okay. Uh, um, kind of highlighted? 
Um, they're just kind of the general standard workup, looking for health. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of the the uh, the standard. That's what most people looking at the stuff are looking at: blood counts, serum chemistries. Time of day or for people, or are you just do? We're just checking. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally am not a huge proponent of just checking a T4, but it's on lots of the panels and a lot of the literature where people looking at similar things have it in there. If if you saw a, a low total T4, it doesn't necessarily yeah, mean right. anything. That's an indication you should look further. Yeah. Um, we talk with the students. Do not treat them just on that. Do some other tests. But, yeah. So it's kind of a down the line, or maybe more of a study plan question. This is a pilot, and you're doing two dogs. Is there a decision point? Are you either proceeding or not based on what you find in these two dogs, and what is going to make that decision? Oh, good question. So theoretically, a pilot is going to lead to a study or not, and it sounds like you're going to do it anyway. So I'm just curious, I guess, why the pilot of two dogs, if it's not going to matter. Well, I, I, go ahead, Judy. I, yeah, I think it it will matter. Um, we, um, as a drug company, you know, I, I don't necessarily um, have one place to do the study. So because of the number of dogs, and um, in your in the area, and because they they are already active, it it looks like a good place to run this study. But if you're not if you don't have any CCD, if you're not identifying any CCD, there's not a lot of community involvement, and probably it's not a good idea for us to be testing the drug first in in Fairbanks. So yes, it's a pilot study, but it's really a pilot study for is this a good place to to begin the testing? Yeah, that's a good question. Is it significant to 11 years? Like is that so it seems pretty young, I don't know, for a lot of dogs. Like I don't yeah. mind just starting to show like, um, and I think not. I think that that comes from the the hope for interventional study. Yeah. Um, certainly you, you'll find all kinds of different numbers um, of what like a senior dog is, depending on what you read. Um, if you guys didn't read it, I know everybody actually reads their journals, but in <laughs> I think the November JAGMA, there was a um, article um, about there's a proposed dogma, I can't remember what dogma stands for, but but looking at dog aging and they're they're want to look at like ultimately like 10,000 dogs or something like that. Um, and I think they are saying different, you know, doing different categories or different sizes. Um, Judy, why, why did you uh, come up with that criteria specifically? Yeah, um, we don't, <laughs> we don't want dogs that die at our hands, basically. Um, so even as you saw, even with our human trials, um, they were 50 to 72. Obviously, most, most patients for Alzheimer's are going to be older. But to start, we want to, we want fairly healthy dogs in every other way. So, um, Preferably we start here, but then we could move into older, even older dogs. Absolutely. And, and one of the things um, I don't know if I really spoke about, um, I mean, we like dogs. There's a lot of interest out there in developing dog models as translational models for things like this. And yeah. not, not just like your lab beagle, but going out there and companion animals. Um, Dogs share our with us. They're like, we don't know why these diseases happen most of the time, um, but they're in the same environment. They're eating similar foods, sometimes the same food. They're exposed to the same things. Um, 
like people are all different. You know, if you get the strains of transgenic mice, they're really not great models for, for coming up with new drugs for these things. They're not a natural model. Um, dogs have this disease really similar to Alzheimer's, like almost identical. Um, it's really hard to do these studies in in Alzheimer's because it, it's such a slowly progressive disease many times. You know, if it takes you 10 years to look at something, like, I mean, how many, how many decades to like answer a question about like one drug or something? Dogs age really fast. These diseases progress a lot faster. Um, and so, you know, here with this, we're talking about three months, um, but, you know, most people looking at aging in dogs are, you know, three months, six months, a year, something like that for, for studies and are seeing significant changes. Um, the paper that they came up with, it, the Cades questionnaire, I mean, they were, they were, I think they were looking at a six month time period and they were seeing progression within, in dogs. And so that's one of the cool things about dogs is, I mean, apart from dogs are cool, um, they're a great model for, for people because their effects, we can see effects so much faster and hopefully we can help dogs. Um, but if we can translate that into ways to help people uh, faster. So the two dogs that you're looking for, you want to be fairly confident and have some uh, yeah, we want we want some like level. other things have been ruled out, and that the things here fairly confident that this is going up, so that yeah. there is change. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we don't. We just want one variable to worry about. And is that something that's like pretty recognized? It's. I think it's going to well, be that's, that, 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 that's one of our, our, our questions is how, how easy is it going to be to do it? And I think, I think recognizing like, yeah, uh, it's just old, old dog versus, you know, actual pathology and, and the subtle changes, like, I mean, people don't necessarily recognize at home. They're not thinking about it. Just think it's aging. And that's where if we're talking to our clients, if we're, using the scale, you know, scoring them, um, perhaps we can pick up those mild guys before they're the really obvious bad. Um, is there going to be like an application deadline for these two? Because I, I don't want to start pushing this to clients and then all of a sudden say, oh, actually they can't find you. Um, and also if that, if there is a deadline, when is it? Um, is this going to be like a scholarship? No, or but there's so they, really... get too many dogs and find the money to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I'm not joking. No, yeah. seriously. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I, I think the idea is that we feel lucky to find two, but we have no clue on how many dogs are out there. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, if we put this up in clinic, I'm sure you're going to have. Yeah. Yeah. There's no drug there. Yeah. There's no. So there's no. Yeah. There's no drug. We're just yeah. looking Based at dogs right now. Yeah. It's kind of a feasibility trial. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's kind of, but and, um. And yeah, also, we, also, I think um, if I have, you know, be, <laughs> I'm a very small little company, so I'm always looking to get um investment from the big um the big veterinary pharma or biotech companies so if i have data that i can show them um it makes it a lot easier for me to get the funding to to do a a, a full blown study um so the sooner we can get the data the sooner i can get out there and show these companies because that that's really what they're saying to me. It's like, great, this sounds interesting, but you have no data. You have you don't even know if you can find these dogs. Um, you can, you know, the the vets know what to do and and how would they test your your drug. If this is already set up, um, it's going to make it a lot easier for me to convince these companies to support this.
along this diagnostic protocol, um, there is something like health problem or comorbidity that arises. Does the funding stop? Um, do they yeah, I don't think we have funds to like treat the health yeah, problem. Sure. And, 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 stuff. Um, and so um, like if you're like, oh yeah, this this dog has some mild impairment, physically looks good, uh, I get blood work and there's you know, he's an EMA kid, he's getting loose or whatever. We're we're not gonna probably go yeah. forward we'll with, with that guy. Um so we plan to, you know, we kind of plan like, okay, we'll we'll, well do physical exams on, you know, a bunch of dogs, we put the blood on some. Nice. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I think what I was trying to figure out is they were gonna have to pay it back. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Or yeah. like they do an MRI and there's a brain tumor in there. Right. Yeah. So yeah, no, I mean we're gonna cover up to okay. we may drop them yeah. from school. Okay. Yeah, that and also further. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Okay. So, but, um, oh yeah. Oh hey, Carl has some. I was going to say, yeah, because because we did have it in the budget for having more than just the two physical exams and the two sets of blood work. Okay. There's there's what we say like ten or so or yeah. whatever. Okay. Uh, we we felt there was money for twenty physical exams and ten sets of blood work. Um, in that screening, yeah, thinking, yeah, um, so thinking, yeah, I mean, so so you're gonna, so it's heavily suspected when you come to the appointments, and it's like, oh, the appointment confirms, oh, it still looks like yes, yeah. then we can do the yeah. So if you, okay, you know, if you've got some back full screening points, right. and it's, the budget's yeah. just tight for the MRI side of things. Gotcha. Yeah. So you're not putting all your eggs in one basket for one dog. Yeah, right. Right. yeah. Right. that makes sense. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, So yeah, we're gonna you know break it up, yeah. and so that clarifies things. Yeah, so if you, it's a funnel. Result of people that need to have to tell us, like, oh, well, we can figure something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the age of yeah. onset. Um, Sorry. I think I think that that's a that's a good question. That's an interesting question. Um, I think that's a little bit of a hard question to answer in because we're not generally like the global. We aren't looking hard for it. Um, like when are the pathologic changes starting to happen in the brain? You know, there's no clinical science. Um, age 11 is on the younger side of old, um, potentially. Um, so I think, uh, actually, I'm just reading a paper the other day and, and you just, you'll find so many different ranges of, of numbers depending on the study and how they did it and how they classify things. Um, but I want to say the 8 to 11 range, it was like 10 or 12 or 15 percent of the population they were looking at that they said had um, some form of CCD. Um, as it went up, when you get up to like the 17 year olds, it was like 85 or 90 percent or, you know, something. Um, and so it is that that balance of like, if I've got a 15 year old, um, yeah, they may have some pretty significant neurodegenerative disease, but they also may have other things or in three months time or six months time or year time, whatever we might want to look at. Like what are the chances that a 15 year old is gonna make it to 16 in the canine population? Like yeah, you know, is, is not always great. Yeah, I feel like when I moved up there, I was surprised how long the dogs in the last so, yeah. that, that is true. I feel like we do have some, especially our sled dogs. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. And that's, I mean, and that's part of why we want to see what we can find with a couple, yeah. you know, just like a couple dogs. Like, if it's super easy, like, if I found two dogs by next week, because You've gone bonkers and found them for me. That's great. Uh, but if it's like a year and yeah. we keep looking and and like yeah, like all of our dogs are cognitive rock stars. Um, yeah. yeah. So that so that's that's part of what we're 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 trying to to figure out. Obviously, with this sample size we have, we're not going to have 
you know, statistics to say the Fairbanks North Star Borough has, you know, 18.2 percent. We're not really, but we'll get a, a flavor of of what we can expect. Are you guys set on that eleven year like, yeah, I think you should go find that. Is this just for the pilot study? Can it be changed later? Um, for for future interventional studies, uh, we were looking at could you make down the, the road? Is, is that age range set in stone? Would that be something you would consider changing, Judy? Yeah, I think I think we could get older. I think I think we tend, you know, coming from a biotech, you tend to be a little um you want you you're conservative um in the sense that you you again we we can't do any harm. So we when it comes to the the drug testing. So um we want them to be as healthy as possible, but still potentially could get um, CCD. You're right. If we're not seeing any, um, we're, we might have to go up on in terms of the age, big, have a larger range. Yeah. Dr. Clark, are you sending us suggested patients that are 13? <laughs> I know. I've got a 13 year old. I, I, I had got on the news, was on KUSC with this the other day, and I had a few people like reach out to me. Um, but like with a really old dog, or JC, one of JC's co workers has a great Dane, and I'm like, I would love to talk to her about a great Dane. And it's eight and a half. I'm like, that's perfect. But my guess is it's not going to fall in our <laughs> Here's a mini great Dane. Um, and, and yeah, so these are limitations. Yeah. 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 I don't think that's a good help, Carly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's probably it, it might have comorbidities. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we can't use it, but uh, yeah. And so, just clarify again that the initial screen is up to 20 dogs, and you're hoping to find 10? We're, we we put in our budget uh, 20 dogs at physical exam, 10 dogs to have blood work, thinking, well, like we'll have someone come in for um, Dr. Rember to take a look, do their wellness, they're 10 years old, um, and do the kids, and oh, well, yeah, she's not going to, it's not going to fit, you know, for whatever she finds something, it's not actually impaired, it's got bad arthritis, um, but Dr. Fisher sees the next appointment, and she finds one that's perfect, and says, okay, great, it's you know, it's checking these boxes, no other significant health problems. Now let's go ahead and draw some blood, you know, do that. That looks good. And then we kind of keep moving them on. Um, and then I think there may be on how many we screen may depend on, like we're not committed to, like it's gotta be this much money. Well, but if somebody, you know, if a patient comes in, it does, does the clinician make the call whether it's gonna get the 370? I mean, so I'm confused. Do they come in and then you're doing it? And you say, "Hey, you might want to, you know, consider this." And then the um, patient comes back for this initial exam. Because it's a physical physical exam that comes in back too. Let's say you come in there. Yeah, I mean, they're presumably going to have. I mean, pretty much every time they're coming in a physical exam, um, and that's and and that's the idea is like if we do some pre-screening, um, like, "Hey, I'm going to be seeing someone." Yeah, yeah, talking ahead of time or yeah, they get their lab yeah, work up that day. Yeah, like, hey, this works out pretty well. You might qualify for this. Then you're like, yeah, actually, they do qualify. Would you then say here's seven three hundred and seventy dollars? And then like, I mean, we back thing, we we, we could do that if we made a, a you could send me a bill, 
instead of them paying. Yeah, but then I mean, um, like, if, if you guys choose, you're like, oh, I actually don't want to move for whatever reason. You know, it's like we could tell people you might qualify to get three hundred and seventy dollars back if they want to leave study. Um, I mean, in in. I mean, being enrolled doesn't mean you're doing like the whole MRI. Sure. So just like, like, give me a shout. Say, hey, I'm seeing this guy. Um, I think he might be a good candidate. Can we kind of enroll him? Will you cover the physical exam and lab work if it looks good? I say, yep, we still have budget. And then. Right. Uh, let's, and, yeah. yeah. So I guess it's just kind of offered like a timeline. When you see the dog, a lot of times you're like, let's do this today. I mean, here. Um, or yeah, you send them away to come back to do it later. Yeah, that. I mean, with people understanding that, like they very well might have to pay for that if you if the study says. Don't no, decide that you figure out part of the final study. Yeah, I think you've already heard the exam for something else. Well, just thinking maybe yeah, we're just like working for anybody who thinks their dog might have. So, what if the Facebook pages for them for the vet clinics post about this? Say, hey, we're looking for we're we're involved in this study, and then you have a day where you line up appointments and we screen them through you first if they are pre-existing clients at our clinic. And then we just have a day where we knock them all up. And that would be paid. They would be coming yeah. in because because that they would know paid. exactly. Yeah. No I matter mean, what the right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, you don't have to pass the test per se. Right. Right. But so if you know. Well, then I just you submit all to, of them to you and say, have at it. I mean, if you know you've got a 50 pound, nine year old dog coming yeah. in, the owner has some concerns about, you know, yeah. Yeah. If, you, yeah. if people wanted to set it up, to do that yeah. and you and know, if say, oh, I'm going to do from each clinic that was doing that, or yeah. just that's for doing that in one day, right? Yeah, and that I mean that would that would work. We just got to you know make sure like oh if you're yeah. you know doing ten, right? So if I were done like you know nineteen or something like that, yeah, you know, but yeah. but yeah, like something like that would would work. Um, it could be it certainly could be awkward yeah. if it's like well they're here now like you could enroll. Cool. Um, yeah. Most people here probably have my cell phone. So, uh, you know, but um, so, I mean, give me a, a shout and say, hey, like, are we good to go? Oh, you I, I mean, if I answer the phone. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's just call like me. Phase, like, you don't have to go get someone to go to someone. No, no. I, I mean, I um, just yeah, need, to, need to, need to, I mean, <laughs> we're going to be done with this by like Friday, based on what I'm hearing from. <laughs> Over here, so you guys can go home. Yeah. Um, no, just I mean, give me give me a shout. Um, I mean, if I'm in class, I may not answer the, the phone right away. Certainly, um, you could drop blood and put in the fridge and say, uh, let me talk to Peach and see if there's funds to do it. And if there are, great, run it. Yeah, um, and 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 in, in terms of the you know, the covering, um, cost of things the best way to do that would be like i saw i saw fluffy and invoice that um physical exam and lab work um to the university um and then yeah um i think we can pay with the credit yeah already. i mean um, somehow, is my understanding yeah, at CSU, I mean, that, you have to have those university Yeah, that's it. I'll tell I'll tell the people to get fair credit. Yeah, yeah. No, they they told me today that if the bill is under twenty five hundred, they can um, cool. pay with a credit card. Yeah. So it's like I don't anticipate any twenty five hundred dollars bills yeah. at least over any one client, but uh, they should. So, oh. yeah. Um, is there a way that you guys could make some kind of client-friendly handout so we're not giving up your personal email? Oh. Yeah. 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 And then we could yeah. advertise that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That. Yes, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah we I have like a date yeah. that we're allowed to start advertising. I mean, you can talk about tomorrow if you like. But uh, I'm not going to have you handout tomorrow. But, uh, yeah. but this is certainly something, I mean, if, if you guys want to start talking to people about it and, and that's part of it. i mean doing it small studies i figure out like the logistics of how stuff works and it might end up looking a little bit different at mckinley versus aurora versus china just because our hospitals are different our systems are 
different. Um, so that's part of why I want to start small. And so we don't have anything blocking our face too much. Uh, is, is a goal. Yeah. Dr. McCray is going to go out, be mobile, and be like, hey, you know, dog, come here. <laughs> you know what might be interesting too? Um, just kind of thinking out loud. Um, I was, <laughs> but I was thinking once this project kicks off to reassemble this group and have kind of like a check in, everybody, uh, you know, say what their experiences have been, their observations, and what you've found. Like every month or two, or whatever it makes sense uh, to keep this community going. I just want to make dinner. I'll make dinner I do appreciate the space to be able to kind of talk about the logistics with everybody. It's been really interesting hearing everybody's input. Especially yeah, the levels too. That was so yeah. cool. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I mean, I love Fairbanks because yeah. everybody talks and works well together. And uh, I think it's yeah one of the one of the nice things here that I haven't necessarily experienced in other places I've practiced. Um, have not had the community we have here. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm totally open to ideas, thoughts. That didn't work. Why the hell did you do that? Right. Um because <laughs> we just want things to be successful. And I mean there's always best plans. So yeah. Um so right. I, I, I like this. So it's actually another reason to come come together. <laughs> it's and I just you, heard yeah. I just heard um in a few months, Denise is going to be hosting a barbecue for us. Thank you. A botanical garden. Oh, sweet. Oh, yeah. I just want to say that um, it, you guys are a really important community for us. And part of that is the clinical outreach, and the other is the MRI. So actually, it wasn't Trim that paid for this dinner. It was the molecular imaging facility uh, that paid for it. And that's the uh, Carl manages that. And that's where our MRI is. And so we are uh, very proud of the MRI where I, I think it has made an impact thanks to you on the veterinary clinical community because of the uh, veterinary diagnostics that we can do with the MRI. And the university puts in about $100,000 a year for that MRI. Uh, and they really want to see research happening with this. And so this is a really exciting opportunity uh, for this kind of research. And also, you know, Priya uh, Dunlap here has another research program that is very exciting that, that isn't a drug uh, development project, but is a uh, diet and lifestyle uh, for dogs. And so that's, we, you know, there's a whole uh, opportunity for a range of interventions uh, that we can do here. And it just depends on, you know, what the community demands, uh, what we want. And so we're, you know, at UAF, we're there for doing research and we happen to be focused on biomedical research and dogs are super cool, you know? I mean, I personally, I think that there's probably more dogs in the survey than people. <laughs> and you know, who here has not loved a dog, you know? Um, and so and and it goes beyond dogs, but right now we're just focused on dogs because it's uh, you gotta have some focus. Well, that's uh, well, the cats are less oh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's really exciting. And you know, you guys we the the veterinary clinical community is receptive to uh, advances and receptive to research. And I think that this is the community for biomedical research. And, and I think, you know, working with dogs, what we find with dogs will have impact on humans, but it's also going to benefit the dogs. And uh, so I'm really excited about this opportunity. And I'm really thankful for your interest and in, for coming and for, especially for Greg, for moving this forward. And it's a duty who, you know, has come with this. And, and thinks we have potential. Yeah. I, I have one more thing. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so just kind of thinking out loud, 
The MRI uh, is supported by the university, heavily supported by the university, but also uh, with user fees because it's a recharge center. And coming up, and I don't remember the date right now, but it's in March. We're going to be having a stakeholder meeting. And uh, so Carl can maybe send you the invite, but we're going to be having uh, our stakeholders who use uh, the MRI, who use the Hammer 4, uh, to come voice their support uh, <laughs> for continued funding uh, for the MRI. And especially if you guys you know, use it for the study, and then for other reasons too. <laughs> Well, people look like they're they're fading. Um, thank everybody for coming out after working all day. Um, reach out to me if you want to have any questions. I'm happy to come up into clinics to talk with docs that are interested. Stats, you know, texts, whatever, um, that are interested in hearing about it, um, just reach out to me and I'll, I'll uh, email uh, some questionnaires and, and stuff out to you guys so you have uh, printable PDFs and, and stuff. Um, and yeah, I, I encourage you to start thinking about it with the older dogs that you see and try using the questionnaire and see how, you know, it works for you if you like it. And, but if you, if you think, uh, if, if you've got someone that you've got in mind that, you know, might be interested, you know, so kind of free screening candidate, give me a call. I mean, if you're like, crap, they're in the room now, call me. <laughs> I'll do my best to answer. Uh, unless I get a day like Joanne and I'm in my office is the classroom. That was Joanne's day today. She was in the classroom all day. So, but, uh, and you're going to make a patient friendly. Yeah. Sure. Owner yeah. yeah, I mean, it could be patient friendly too, but that might be more taste and smell. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm going to close this with a cat joke. <laughs> Why are cats such terrible storytellers? <laughs> that was too practical. They can't talk um, because they have only one tail. Oh. <laughs> I need dog jokes. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.